on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips and you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We are live from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up this afternoon, Rishi Sunak is warned his entire government is on the line after the Rwanda migrant scheme is torn up by the Supreme Court. Sunak will address the nation this afternoon to insist he has a plan B, uh, but a group of right-wing Tory MPs warned the PM his response to the judgment is now a confidence issue and an existential threat to the entire future of the Conservative Party. Meanwhile, the BBC used the cover of the Rwanda ruling to sneak out an apology after wrongly accusing Israeli defence forces of targeting a hospital in Gaza. All of that is coming up, but first, let's get the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Alex. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak's faced a fiery Prime Minister's questions after the Supreme Court ruled his Rwanda deportation scheme can't go ahead. His government was appealing an earlier ruling which said it was unlawful to send asylum seekers to the African nation. Well, this morning, judges agreed with the decision, saying Rwanda has a poor human rights record. Well, Labour leader Sakir Starmer called the Rwanda plan a ridiculous, pathetic spectacle. But Rishi Sunak said he's already looking at other ways to make it work. The government has been working already on a new treaty with Rwanda, and we will finalise that in light of today's judgment. And furthermore, if necessary, I am prepared to revisit our domestic legal frameworks. Let me assure the House my commitment to stopping the boats is unwavering. It's reported some Conservative MPs will now want the Prime Minister to pull the UK out of European Convention on Human Rights. Some better news for Rishi Sunak today, though. He is on track to meet his target of halving inflation. New figures show the rising cost of prices slowed to 4.6% in October, down from 6.7% in September. It's largely down to an easing off of energy prices. The BBC have issued an on-air apology for falsely reporting information about Israeli military action inside Gaza's main Al-Sharifa hospital this morning. Israel says it is targeting Hamas, which it believes is running a command centre underneath the building, something it denies. However, the broadcaster said the Israeli Defence Force were targeting medics and Arabic speakers. And now uh, an apology from the BBC. A BBC News, uh, as it covered uh, initial reports that Israeli forces has entered Gaza's main hospital. We said that medical teams and Arab speakers were being targeted. This was incorrect and misquoted a Reuters report. We should have said IDF forces included medical teams and Arabic speakers for this operation. So we apologise for this error, which fell below our usual editorial standards. Greta Thunberg has pleaded not guilty at a London court where she's charged with a public order offence. The Swedish climate activist was arrested while protesting an oil and gas industry conference in London last month. The 20-year-old appeared alongside several other activists, including some from Greenpeace. The number of people dying from infection resistant to antibiotics has increased. The UK Health Security Agency says around 2,200 patients died because of them last year, an annual jump of just under 100. Experts are warning of a concerning rise in the number of drugs not working. And the NHS is promising that cervical cancer will be limited by the year 2040. It's being put down to improve vaccination rates and screening. Currently, around 2,600 women a year in England are diagnosed with the cancer. Health bosses are calling for catch-up jabs to be offered in places like libraries and sports venues in areas with low take-up of the vaccine. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. 
Hello there. Well, today the wet weather is in the north. Tomorrow it'll be in the south. And Friday looks like being a dry day for everybody. But certainly for uh, today, we've seen that rather heavy rain over parts of uh, Scotland, stretching its way down through the northwest into central areas as well. But down towards the south, some lovely sunshine to come, even though it won't be that warm. Temperatures 12 or 13 degrees Celsius, but early blustery winds starting to die away. There'll be some sunshine in the extreme north as well, but not very warm there. Temperatures 4 to 6 degrees Celsius by the middle of the afternoon. Now, it's becoming increasingly mild from the southwest as the cloud works its way into parts of uh, Devon and Cornwall, Southern Ireland and South Wales. That's going to bring some heavy rain through this evening, overnight and into tomorrow. That rain pushing its way eastwards. But overnight, clear skies in the far north could allow temperatures to fall as low as minus 6 degrees Celsius. So a widespread frost there and also a bright start to Thursday morning. But elsewhere, a good deal of cloud. Here's the rain. It could actually move a little further north than that. We've got showers through easternmost counties and a further band of cloud and rain working its way into western parts of Ireland. Temperatures on the day, anything between 5 and 9 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome to the show. Well, wow, a lot's coming up <laughs> over the next few hours, including yet another example of utter BBC bias, and in this case, getting their facts plain wrong. On a day where there's so much going on, Kev, you'd think at least uh, the nation's public service broadcaster might do their fact-checking and research. Yes, uh, they blamed uh, Israel for another attack, and uh, they said that they were reporting what Reuters had said. Mm. Uh, and Reuters said, well, we didn't say this. So the BBC has been forced to make a grovelling apology. And what is the scandal of that? OK, fair enough. Journalists get things wrong sometimes. You have to apologise. This is the second time mm. this has happened in this reasonably short war. Uh, so uh, the BBC's got to have a look at itself. But what, what is, I think is more of a scandal is they issued this apology just as the Rwanda right. verdict was being delivered. Like a, so in other, yeah. words, in other words, a good day for the to, BBC to bury bad news. To bury bad news. It's like a political party spin operation, own. isn't yeah. it? Yeah. But, I mean, it is true. What they did, essentially, was Reuters were reporting how the IDF had said that they were using Arabic translators to get incubators and medicines into uh, the hospital. And the BBC reported this as they were targeting Arabs in the hospital. Arab speakers. I, mean, I mean, it's just that you couldn't really get more different an in interpretation of the story from yeah. the one that was on the wires. And, by the way, uh, you're in the Al-Shifa hospital in the middle of Gaza targeting Arab speakers. Speakers basically is everyone, isn't it? So, I mean, everyone's going to speak Arabic in there. But uh, yeah, I mean, they, the, the BBC tried to sort of slip this apology, uh, you know, under the uh, ba the banner and uh, get away with it that we wouldn't notice. That's outrageous, outrageous. Yeah, well, I mean, we have been kept on our toes by lots of other news, though, haven't we? And another thing that is <laughs> worth saying... Anything going on? And yeah, <laughs> who's telling the truth here? Is it Rishi Sunak? Is it Suella Braverman? Is it a whole host of other voices when it comes to the continuously defunct Rwanda policy and whether a plane will ever take off? Of course, you've got Keir Starmer saying, well, we said it was never going to work. I kind of agree with him. Then you've got Suella Braverman saying, well, actually, if you did this, it would have worked. Then you've got Rishi Sunak saying, somehow, this ruling that says it's illegal actually demonstrates that sending migrants to Rwanda is legal. It's just, well, no, well, it's he's, no, what he's saying is uh, sending migrants to another country is legal. And uh, the way I, can, I perceive it is that these judges, the Supreme Court judges, uh, are basically said... You can't trust those pesky Rwandans. So if we send our migrants to East Africa, to Rwanda, the Supreme Court has ruled that they're likely to repatriate these migrants to their home countries where they might be persecuted. So uh, basically this is a, a gesture of mistrust in yeah, Rwanda by our Supreme Court. It's an extremely sad day, frankly, for democracy because what we've seen increasingly is we have this really complex Gordian knot of uh, legislative tort um, lefty judges in Strasbourg back here, whether it's the ECHR, whether it's the Human Rights Act. Basically, we live in a world of lawfare. The government lawfare. cannot do what they want to do. The people won't be represented because a few people in wigs actually think they know best. And by the way, Rishi in PMQ's Prime Minister's questions today, he, he didn't 
look quite his kind of calm, technocrat, managerial self, yeah. did he? He looked kind of rattled. And don't forget, uh, we're also going to be covering at great length the massive row between Rishi and his former Home Secretary, Suella Braverman. Mm. Uh, and uh, the fallout from that is extraordinary. We're going to be talking to Tory MPs, we're going to be talking to journalists uh, about what exactly is going on and just mm. how much damage Suella Braverman can do to the Prime Minister. But I thought the Prime Minister Minister looked extremely worried at PMQs. He did. I think he said countries up and down the family, uh, which shows that he was a slightly rattled, but, you know, opposers of Sunak saying they're going to create merry hell for him over coming weeks. I think he can do that all by himself. Yeah, he's not going to have a very nice week, to say the least. And it started so well with the reappointment of David Cameron. Oh, wait a minute. It didn't start well <laughs> with the reappointment of David Cameron. But we are asking you now uh, that the Rwanda scheme is unlawful. What does Rishi do next? And we'd love to hear from you too. So call us on 0344 499 1000, text us on 87222, or tweet us on X at Talk TV. Uh, but to that top story now, and the Prime Minister says he's working on a new treaty with Rwanda after the Supreme Court ruled his plan unlawful in a major blow for the government. The President of the Supreme Court, Lord Reid, said there was a risk that genuine refugees would be returned to the country they fled from. We accept the Home Secretary's submission that the Rwandan government entered into the agreement in good faith and that the capacity of the Rwandan system to produce accurate and fair decisions can and will be built up. Nevertheless, asking ourselves whether there were substantial grounds for believing that a real risk of reformment existed at the relevant time we have concluded that there were. The changes needed to eliminate the risk of reformant may be delivered in the future, but they have not been shown to be in place now. The Home Secretary's appeal is therefore dismissed. Wow, well, Rishi Sunak then had a heated exchange with the Labour leader at Prime Minister's Questions, where Sir Keir Starmer accused him of wasting time and money on the plan. He talks about taking small boats crossing seriously. He's opposed every single measure that we have taken, Mr Speaker. Again, let me update him on what we've done this year. The number of illegal Albania arrivals down by 90%. 20,000 people returned this year. The number of crossings down by a third. He mentioned hotels closing 50 of them. Money being saved for taxpayers. All, all, by the way, opposed by the party opposite. What is the honourable gentleman's plan? Ah, yes, there we have it. A cosy deal with the EU, which would see the UK accept 100 thousand illegal migrants. He doesn't want to stop the boat, he wants to welcome more of them. Mr Speaker, it's very straightforward. He promised, he promised that he would stop the boats this year. Yeah. This year. Today is the 15th of November. He's wasted all of his time on a gimmick and now he's absolutely nowhere. Will he level with the British public and finally admit He's failed to deliver on his promise. Yeah. Extraordinary. Joining us now is Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw. Uh, Danny, uh, the Prime Minister in Prime Minister's question time just now, uh, arguing there with Keir Starmer, uh, he uh, indicated that he might seek to uh, plug this loophole uh, in the Rwanda scheme, uh, because essentially the judges are, are saying you can't trust Rwanda not to repatriate our migrants to their home countries where they face, where they may face persecution. Uh, so uh, Rishi, uh, I think, is pledging or possibly planning to rewrite the deal with Rwanda, which would specifically get Rwanda to uh, pledge not to do that. That, I think, is where he's standing. Uh, but my instinct is he won't really bother to do that because it would take, like, a year. Uh, and uh, the less said about the Rwanda scheme by Rishi Sunak on his part from now on, the better, I would have thought. Oh, it sounds like we don't uh, have Danny's audio there. Uh, you, you muted there, Danny. Uh, Danny, I think you might have muted yourself. 
OK, uh, well, we're, we're going to go to now. Ben Lockman now. We'll come back to uh, uh, Danny, who's having sound problems. Uh, ben is from the uh, Conservative think tank, the Bow Group, and an expert on the migrant crisis. Uh, welcome, Ben. Uh, your take on what happened today, as I was just saying, Sunak in PMQs indicating he might go back uh, and rewrite the deal with Rwanda so that they're banned from repatriating our migrants to their home countries. They agree not to do that. But my instinct is he'll just shelve the whole thing now. The less he says about Rwanda from now on, the better. It's a nightmare for him, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. I remember when the uh, Rwanda scheme was first announced and I said to you, it's never going to happen. None of those planes are ever going to get to Rwanda. Even if they do, those people won't stay there. And now, look, we've wasted a year effectively pursuing this stupid policy, which was never going to work. It seemed to me like it was a distraction tactic the entire time. I think they all knew it wasn't going to work. It was just um, a sort of a, de a delay tactic. It was, oh, don't worry, as soon as Rwanda goes through, it will all be solved. But uh, surely they must have known that it was never going to work. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree with that more. I mean, 140 million spent in legal battles at the very least over this past year. Uh, but it, it has sort of created new arguments and old arguments to come to the fore of quite how this country is governed, whether we should be in things like the European Convention of Human Rights, whether we need to look at the Human Rights Act, uh, whether we should be allowing organisations, supranational organisations like the UN to wade in, who actually governs this country. Yeah, I think there's a really good opportunity here for James Cleverly to turn around and learn from the mistakes of both um, Suella and Pretty, who did the similar sort of thing to each other and um, basically say this isn't an issue of getting a deal with Wanda or getting some sort of uh, domestic policy change. It's about, fundamentally, it's about international diplomacy and dealing with large globalist institutions such as, um, you know, the UN and uh, uh, the EU. And when you look at things like the ECHR, which are the main blockade to us removing these people in the first place, um, that's what should be addressed. Get rid of the ECHR, scrap the Human Rights Act, focus on return deals with these countries, which are actually matters of diplomacy, not matters of domestic law, and then you might have a chance of getting to grips with the issue. But unfortunately, we've spent the past year wasting our time trying to pass things through the House of Commons, which, even if passed, wouldn't achieve what they want to. Uh, Dominic Cummings uh, was tweeting this morning that he's told successive administrations that unless you leave the ECHR, unless you scrap the Human Rights Act, uh, you are never going to stop the boats. And he says that basically uh, successive prime ministers sort of stuck their fingers in their ears and refused to listen. And, of course, yeah. uh, Suella Braverman's letter last night uh, accused the prime minister of magical thinking, just sort of basically hoping that the uh, Rwanda mm. scheme would get approval uh, when deep down he probably knew it wouldn't. Uh, and uh, Suella and Dominic reveal, or they uh, allege, they accuse all of these prime ministers, all of these uh, administrations, uh, from for of not really being committed to stop the boats. In the end, Rishi, uh, Boris, possibly uh, Theresa May before, and maybe even David Cameron, never really cared about the migrant mm. crisis. Yeah, I think that might be right. Um, you know, if you look at what Suella said, she said that Rishi promised to do absolutely anything necessary to stop the boats. And she said, effectively, well, you know that if you scrap the Human Rights Act and withdraw from the ECHR, that will go a long way to resolving it. So why haven't you done that? You've, you've effectively lied if you said that you'll do anything, but then stop short of doing that. Um, look, anyone who's, who's uh, been aware of what's going on in this issue for a few years now knows that it comes down to the ECHR and the Human Rights Act. Those are the two major blockades to actually getting anything done. So it does baffle me that they uh, sort of put their fingers in their ears, as you, as you say, and basically, I think they, they, they take the uh, British public for mugs, really, when they, when they pretend that they don't know that that's the solution. I think everyone else does. I mean, does this not come down to, at the end of the day, a party that can't govern itself, let alone govern the country? I remember discussions about leaving the ECHR back when we were signing up to the Lisbon Treaty in around 2009. Mm. We've had a Conservative government this whole time and the fight seems to constantly be within the party rather than the party being able to get behind one thing and get it done. 
Yeah, absolutely. The internal politics is really damaging to the country at large. And now you've got people putting in letters against Rishi Sunak. And on the one hand, I don't, you know, don't blame them because he's been fairly useless recently, especially when it comes to um, the Rwanda situation. But will that actually help? to get things done in this country. I mean, we're, we're having another leadership contest and having a new Tory prime minister. And then the same thing goes on and on again. I think it's time for the Conservative Party, frankly, to die off. And, and we need some sort of uh, new uh, party in this country to take uh, take its place. Because, frankly, it's proven that it, it's not responsible and it can't be trusted to run the government. Oh, well, nobody needs to kill off the Tory party. They're, per <laughs> they're perfectly capable of committing suicide, uh, which is what they seem to be doing right now. We're hearing that Rishi Sunak will give a press conference, address the nation, if you like, at quarter to five this afternoon. Uh, and this will revolve around Suella's uh, accusation that he didn't have a plan B uh, for mm -hmm. the ruling that happened today. He said, you know, you just hoped it might get approval, uh, and if it didn't get approval, you should have made plans, and you, ha and you haven't. So far, as I said earlier, his plan B, which it looks as if he cooked up over coffee this morning, uh, is, oh, well, we might sort of, like, go back to Rwanda and do a deal with them uh, in which they'll have to promise not to repatriate our migrants. And what I'm thinking about here, Ben, as well, as we discuss all of this, I mean, it, even if this plan did get the go-ahead and, uh, you know, we managed to get a plane off the ground, we're only talking about a few hundred, aren't we? This yeah. does seem to be a lot of fuss about nothing. Yeah, this is the problem. Uh, you know, Suella's correct that he didn't really have a plan B, but even plan A was not you know, very effective, even if it had gone the way he wanted. You're talking about a few hundred people. And then you've also got the issue of the fact that each, like the ruling, all it would have established is that it was legal in principle. It wouldn't have ruled that it was legal for each and every one of the migrants that you then want to put on a plane to Rwanda. Each of those would have had a right to turn around and challenge their de deportation on individual basis. So they could, you know, effectively you know, rig the system, as it were, keep keep the delay tactics going, and most people would never actually get sent abroad. So I don't really understand what Rishi thought he was doing with Rwanda. It was a silly scheme from the beginning. It wasn't his idea. It was a Boris-era policy. I think when he came in, he should have scrapped Rwanda from day one and focused on tackling the ECHR and the human rights there. So Suella Bravman is completely correct that he doesn't really seem to know what he's doing. Well, he, he's, what he's been doing, Ben, is he's, he's been thinking magically. Uh, thanks for talking to us. Uh, we're going to go over now to uh, Home Affairs correspondent Danny Shaw. Yeah, Danny, uh, we're hearing now that Rishi has actually spoken to uh, the Rwandan president since the Supreme Court's ruling uh, that the Rwanda scheme is illegal. So I assume he's trying to get some kind of deal back on track that would ban Rwanda from repatriating our migrants. Is that your understanding of the situation? Well, he says that he is going to get a treaty. At the moment, all it is is a memorandum of understanding. It's, it's, a, it's an agreement. It hasn't been ratified by Parliament. So to get a treaty ratified by Parliament would certainly put it on a more solid footing. And if in that treaty it says that Rwanda agrees absolutely categorically that people with valid asylum claims would not be sent back to their country of origin, to their home country, then that would be a start. But the big problem, Kevin, is that the Court of Appeal, now backed by the Supreme Court in the most unequivocal terms, has said that there are major problems with the way those asylum claims are determined. So although you can have a, a guarantee that people won't be sent back to their uh, to their country of origin, if the claims aren't determined properly, then that guarantee is worthless. And you cannot, I think, just overnight or within the space of a few months, make the processes and procedures in, in Rwanda better and suitable for such an agreement. I mean, let's look, let's be absolutely clear about this. This was not a narrow sort of a judgment by the Supreme Court, you know, three versus two or four versus yeah, five. One. It nil, was wasn't it? Yeah. All five justices, they took far less time than everyone thought they would take because it was quite clearly a, a clear case. And they have spelled out, and I would urge people to read the judgment or the summary of it, they have spelled out a whole series of reasons why Rwanda is not a suitable place at the moment for people to have their asylum claims processed. And I can't see 
that even if you have a treaty, even if you make some changes, I can't see that, that those problems identified by the Supreme Court are going to be sort of um, rectified uh, very easily. Sure. Thank you ever so much, Danny Shaw. Glad we managed to get you back then. <laughs> well, coming up after the break, Suella Braverman accuses the PM of betraying the nation and backtracking on his promises to her. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and you're with Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You see, like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandering to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. <laughs> there's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying this now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> Got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, 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 no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to do. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan and this is Crosstalk on TV, on Talk TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, Suella Braverman's letter to the Prime Minister in the wake of her sacking as Home Secretary has sent shockwaves through Westminster. Yeah, she has accused Rishi Sunak of betrayal, duplicity and weakness and implied he was unfit to be Prime Minister, Braverman was sacked in the reshuffle on Monday after opponents accused her of stoking tensions ahead of pro-Palestinian marches in London. Joining us is uh, political commentator James Melville. Uh, good afternoon, James. Uh, so, Suella, you know, she is now in prime position to make life, I mean, almost literally hell for Rishi Sunak after today's ruling. First of all, she said you had no plan B, uh, should 
the judges, the Supreme Court, decide that the plan, the Miranda scheme, is illegal. Uh, and frankly, to be honest with you, we've discovered this morning she's exactly right. The thing about that 1,800 word, she called it a resignation letter. It wasn't technically. She'd been fired. But that extraordinary 1,800 word letter, uh, you read through it. I mean, we don't know the truth of everything, but it rang true to me. And I think that's why Rishi Sunak looked really rattled in Prime Minister's question time today, because he's been found out. I completely agree. I'm no fan of Bradman at all. I think what she said, for instance, about the homeless was disgusting, actually. But there's components of our letter that will resonate with Tory MPs, certainly with Sunak, but also the public at large. It's not just on this issue in terms of immigration. It's on everything else as well. Failure to deliver. I think that's the worst words of the law. Mm. Failure to deliver. Said by former Home Secretary about the Prime Minister. And she's right. What has he actually done since he's been Prime Minister? He's the great self-entitled Prime Minister, who effectively by proxy took down two other Prime Ministers to become Prime Minister, and he's achieved nothing. Absolutely nothing. I mean, he's that boasting now about cutting inflation. Inflation's still going up, albeit at a lesser rate. But there's still a massive cost of living crisis, of which, when he was Chancellor, he contributed to a lot of that. And he was asleep at the wheel until it was too late. On every single major indicator, key performance indicators, our Prime Minister has failed. And then it gets worse than that. He doesn't connect with the British public. And that explains why the Tories are running but 30 points behind in the polls. Labour haven't sealed the deal. I mean, they've got their own issues. But we have a prime minister who hasn't done anything since he's been prime minister and isn't connecting. And he has, to quote um, the ex-home uh, secretary, failed to deliver. I mean, sometimes I wonder how the UK isn't down the plug hole altogether after a year of basically no government while they fought like rats in a sack to decide who should be the leader and therefore the PM. And it seems to me, actually, I'm going to defend Sunak a little bit here, which is it seems to me what keeps happening every time there's a change of guard at the top of the Tory party is the new prime minister comes in, wants to make his mark, inherits a load of back of the fag packet policies that they didn't come up with themselves. And it's just a constant scramble to figure out what they are doing from one minute to the next. I mean, the fault, frankly, is the fact that you've got a party here which doesn't know what it believes in. Yes, very good point. You know, another point that was raised is no vision. You know, something I've mentioned a number of times. We, they don't have any vision at all. They're like a fag end administration. They've run out of ideas. But we've got a new prime minister. He should have loads of ideas. Nothing has been achieved. There's no legacy policies at all. If you look at the issues that are of prime concern for the majority of people in the country, I think most people are concerned about roughly the same things. It's about what's happening with uncontrolled immigration in various communities. It's about the NHS, perpetual crisis in winter, crumbling schools, and the ongoing cost of living crisis. And we're coming into another winter of discontent, which will probably finish Sunak off. I think the Tories are going to have a heavy price to pay at the next general election, and deservedly so. And this prime minister, he will go down in history, if he's not careful, as one of the worst prime ministers in modern history, because he hasn't actually achieved something. It comes back to the point that Bradman made. He's failed to deliver. What's he actually done? And I think the public at large are looking at the squabbles and the resignations or the you know, reshuffles and the sackings, and we're fed up with it. We want a competent government. The majority of people in this country are crying out for strong leadership, legacy policies, and a prime minister and government who gets their concerns. We're, we just don't have that. And we haven't had it for a very long time. And the reason we've got a multitude of problems in this country and many key issues is because the government haven't actually done anything. Well, We're paying our taxes for ineptitude and gross negligence on a huge scale. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick you up on something there, James, uh, because I don't quite agree. You say he hasn't achieved anything, Rishi Sunak. He has. He's achieved an absolute miracle. He has brought somebody back from the dead, from beyond the grave. His <laughs> name is David Cameron. Oh, hush my mouth, Lord Cameron. Uh, that was an act of utter desperation that I still can't get my head around. What does Sunak think he's going to achieve by bringing back that old dinosaur? Does he think there's votes in it? Because if he does, I've got bad news for him. It's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, Cameron is toxic. You know, based on what happened after, on both sides, in terms of the Brexit side of the debate and the Remain side of the debate, you know, you throw in what he did in terms of um, a botched um, 
uh, policy in uh, Libya in terms of military interventionism and also austerity. And they brought back this dinosaur of failure. Another bad prime minister. How is that going to connect with the public? <laughs> exactly right. It's, it's just ridiculous. We seem to have these, these politicians like Gold and Grant Shapps and now David Cameron and Tony Blair getting suggested as a humanitarian envoy in Gaza. We've, we've got these ghouls from the past, these failed politicians who don't connect with the public. They seem to just be feathering their own nest in terms of wealth or power. And yet they keep coming back to haunt us. It is an extraordinary appointment, and I, I still can't get my head around. I mean, what's quite fascinating is Sakia Starmer, old Lego head himself, is managing to <laughs> land some pretty significant blows on Sunak because he's just, you know, self-combusting. And yet, at the same time, all the noise from Braverman and the fiasco that is the, the, the botched Rwanda plan is covering up the fact today, remarkably, that the Labour Party are also having a massive fallout on an extremely critical subject, which is what the UK government should say and do about Israel, with him threatening to sack those people in the shadow cabinet who don't support the Labour Party's position of, well, frankly, a ceasefire, which is long humanitarian pauses every single day, when not actually supporting a ceasefire. The problem we've got in our parliament is actually both parties are split into multiple factions and we just get faction fighting instead of leadership. I completely agree with all of that. I mean, the Labour are ahead simply because the government are so bad. But they don't look like a government in waiting. It's not like back in 97 whereby, you know, Blair was a professional machine and they looked ready. This isn't the case. We, again, Starmer doesn't connect with people either. We've got Sunak, a machine corporatist prime minister versus one of the dullest leaders in history. What a choice. I mean, and that's why, the most important issue of all, that's why... The British voters, there's a disconnect with the politicians. They're disengaged, they're disenfranchised. And meanwhile, we've got over 7 million people who are struggling to put food on the table or clothe their children or heat their houses. And we're going into another winter of discontent. And the vast majority of people are looking at these two parties and thinking, well, just what's the lesser of two evils? It's a terrible zero-sum game choice that we're all facing going into the next election. And also, uh, the democracy seems to be at stake here. As Suella Bravman pointed out in her incendiary letter last night, you know, nobody chose Rishi Sunak. He's not elected. He, he uh, got the job by default because Liz Truss, Truss made a bit of a mess of it. He was the person that the Tory party and, in effect, the country rejected to be prime minister. We ended up with him. Uh, so Suella and others try to give him the benefit of the doubt. And what does he do? Uh, on Monday, brings in an unelected non-MP to be Foreign Secretary, one of the great offices of, of state. I would suggest uh, that that uh, showed a, a sort of abrogation of Prime Minister, Prime Ministerial responsibility. You should get someone who's elected, shouldn't you? Completely. I mean, it's, it's about democracy. And, you know, we've got an abuse of democracy here now. You know, we've got the entitled Prime Minister who's sort of... There was very little opposition effect and certainly no vote even amongst Tory members. And now David Cameron, you know, presenting foreign policy in the House of Lords. It's absolutely outrageous. And I think this is a final straw for this government. And Labour are lucky. You know, Labour, you know, is at least said, you know, sooner win for Labour because all they need to do over the next year, the Labour opposition, is to literally say nothing and they'll win. Because this government... Are, you know, they've run out of steam and now they're acting in pretty grubby, um, undemocratic ways. I mean, having David Cameron as foreign secretary, based on his backstory and the fact that he's not actually a sitting MP, is too much for most people. And I think the sad thing about this is we've got a multitude of problems in the country on many, many issues. And we have probably the worst government and the worst opposition at exactly the worst time. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you for your apocalyptic vision, James <laughs> Melville. <laughs> well, coming up after the break, the BBC has issued an on-air apology after a misleading report on Israeli activity in Gaza. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Crosstalk on Talk TV. On TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, the BBC has issued an on-air apology this morning for their false reporting on the Israeli Defence Forces' actions inside Gaza's Al-Shifa hospital. The organisation incorrectly stated that Reuters were reporting that the IDF were targeting Arab speakers and medical staff after Israeli troops attacked the medical facility on Tuesday. BBC News responded with this statement today. And now uh, an apology from the BBC. A BBC News, uh, as it covered uh, initial reports that Israeli forces has entered Gaza's main hospital. We said that medical teams and Arab speakers were being targeted. This was incorrect and misquoted a Reuters report. We should have said IDF forces included medical teams and Arabic speakers for this operation. So we apologise for this error, which fell below our usual editorial standards. The correct version of events was broadcast minutes later. Gosh, what a mistake to make. Sounds like they're normal editorial I mean, it's standards absolutely to absolutely incredible. It's not the first time they've done it in this war. It was just Shocking. a couple of weeks ago. So, BBC, raise your game, eh? Well, meanwhile, on the ground in Gaza, the IDF has confirmed it's continuing its operation in the Shiva hospital while also providing aid. The group tweeted this morning, we can now confirm that incubators, baby food and medical supplies provided by the IDF have successfully reached the hospital. Our medical team and Arabic-speaking soldiers are on the ground to ensure that these supplies reach those in need. Well, joining us now from Jerusalem is the Sun senior news reporter Paul Sims, who has witnessed firsthand the situation on the ground in Gaza. I mean, Paul, it seems that there's a sort of a he said, she said, and surprisingly, or perhaps not surprisingly, the BBC seems to be on the side of Hamas on this one. Um, but it all comes down to, at the end of the day, US intelligence saying this morning they do believe there is a Hamas cell operating under that hospital, and that's for this reason Israel is now going in and trying to weed people out. What's your understanding from the intelligence you're getting? Sorry, I'm... What are, those sorry. Mis are those missiles? Repeat that again for me, please. Yeah, what is your intelligence on what is going on in the Al-Shifa hospital? Right, sorry. Um, so, this morning, the IDF, the Israeli Defence Forces, contacted officials within Gaza to let them know that, essentially, they would be entering the hospital. So, essentially, they gave them free warning. Minutes later, they stormed into the Al-Shifa hospital. They threw in smoke grenades, uh, and then they went from ward to ward, floor to floor, looking for Hamas terrorists uh, and looking for intelligence, looking for information. Um, there wasn't any, I mean, there's lots of reports of gunfire, gunfights. Uh, the IDF have announced uh, in, in the last few hours that there isn't any friction between them, and that's their word, between them and the patients or the medical staff, um, that they are methodically going through this hospital looking for the, uh, any signs of the mass tunnels, any signs of hostages, and also the, the arsenal, the weaponry that's been collected and stockpiled within the hospital by, by Hamas. And you, you, you make a very, very important point when you say that the US intelligence confirmed separately last night that they too understood that the Al-Shifa was being used as a human shield by Hamas. That's essentially gave the green light for the IDF. Their operation is still ongoing. It will take um, a, a number of hours, I think. They've, they've certainly secured the hospital. Um, and what they're doing is they are interviewing absolutely everyone there. They've taken 16-year-olds to 40-year-old males into the courtyard. They are interrogating them. They're interviewing them. They're trying to find out as much information as possible. They're trying to build up a picture. And they're looking for any signs of those 240 hostages who were kidnapped on October the 7th. Uh, Paul, uh, last time we spoke to you was last week where you and photographer Dan Charity has filed an amazing uh, report of uh, the Hamas uh, headquarters that you'd visited and you were right in the heart of Gaza, right where the frontline fighting was happening. Uh, you're in Jerusalem now, presumably planning to go back in when and if you can. Uh, since we last spoke to you, how has the conflict developed? Uh, is Israel any further in its mission to destroy Hamas? Where are we standing here? I think, I, I, I think from my assessment so far from the IDF, they are methodical and they are um, inching ever closer into Gaza City. 
Um, they are searching through buildings. I mean, the buildings are just complete shells, but with inside those buildings, there is potentially valuable um, information, intelligence that they can gather. Um, they, they, they are essentially trying to cut off the head of the snake. So the further you go in, the more chance you have of doing that. And what they're trying to do, one of the main things, is to find the tunnels that Hamas are using beneath Gaza and Gaza City so that, so that they, can, they can essentially limit their ability to move, limit their ability to, to manoeuvre weapons, drones and what have you, and to weaken their capabilities. I mean, what I've noticed quite a lot in the last uh, couple of weeks is that the number of rocket attacks that have come in from Gaza, I mean, we're getting alerts daily, but they're not as much as they were a couple of weeks ago. So Hamas's ability, Hamas's firepower, its, its capabilities are being weakened because of the Israeli forces on the ground and the airstrikes that are coordinated alongside it. I mean, Paul, the IDF say that they are conducting this operation with uh, surgical precision. It's extremely targeted. Back home in the UK, there's a huge debate surrounding whether we need longer humanitarian pauses to get uh, fuel in, to get medicine in and people out. My question to you is, even if that were the case, who would be the people in Gaza to control where medicine goes, where fuel goes and who does get to come out? That, that's, the, that's the key issue, isn't it? I mean, who, who, if Israel take control of, uh, of Gaza and Gaza City, uh, who, who does deliver that aid? You can't rely on Hamas. Hamas have been diverting funds for years to prop up their terror organisation. They've been using it to develop their tunnels below ground, so much so that the tunnels now extend to about 311 miles. So in terms of who delivers that aid, it's a very, very good question. And I'm not sure whether anyone has that answer at the moment. Um, you, you'd look to the UN. You look to humanitarian groups. There's talk at the moment of a potential deal for uh, some of the uh, Israeli hostages to be released uh, and, and for that to be facilitated with Palestinian women and children incarcerated in Israeli jails going the opposite way. You would have to have a humanitarian pause, a, a ceasefire uh, to, to some degree. Um, but there's no, yeah, it, 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 there's nothing more permanent, I guess, than a, than a, than a temporary ceasefire um, and the Israelis want to weaken Hamas they they want to they want to really cut off the head of the snake before anything like that happens so for the time being like I, I, like I say it's a very good question but I'm not sure those answers are, 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 are there for us to, to see at the moment yeah well thank you ever so much for joining us Paul Sims there live from Jerusalem and me meanwhile, the uh, fallout from the conflict in the Middle East continues to make waves in the UK as a number of Labour front benches prepare to vote in support of an immediate call for a ceasefire in Gaza. Keir Starmer warned ministers this morning that they will be sacked if they vote in favour of the SNP-led Commons vote, which would directly contradict the party line. The Labour leader has angered many Labour members over his support for Israel's right to defend itself and has resisted calls for a ceasefire. To say to Israel, whilst its citizens are still being held, um, you should have a ceasefire, in my view, is inconsistent with saying it's their right to try and get their hostages back. If hostages were taken from this country, uh, we would be doing everything we could to get them back and we wouldn't take kindly to somebody saying, I'm afraid we don't think you should be doing that. Well, Starmer now plans to table a Labour amendment criticising Israel but stopping short of calling for a full ceasefire in a bid to maintain party unity. Joining us now is former Labour government adviser Matthew Laza. I mean, I understand that there's already potentially up to 50 rebels in the Labour Party against Starmer's position, which I believe is longer daily humanitarian pauses, which, what, well, it's beginning to sound rather like, if you string all those together, a bit of a ceasefire. He's in a rock well, well, between a rock and a hard place right now, isn't he? Well, it is very difficult for Keir, but I don't think that does amount to a cause for a ceasefire. I think it echoes what the British government is saying, what the American government, Israel's uh, strongest friend in the world, is saying, uh, which is that we need to get more aid in than is currently, than is currently going in. Um, I think what, what Keir's doing is standing very firm. I think what we'll see today is there, there may be a small number of rebels from the front bench, and if they do rebel, they will be sacked. They're wrong to rebel, in my view, and I would say to them, don't, uh, because virtue signalling with the SNP is not going to help anybody. But if they do, Keir will 
be quite right and they won't be front benches by this time tomorrow. But the Labour Party, including we're told as many as 12 front benches in the shadow cabinet, uh, is full of uh, ceasefire absolutists. You know, a perfectly understandable stand standpoint. Uh, this is building up to a massive problem. I mean, you know, Keir Starmer, in all his worst nightmares, would not imagine, say, last Friday, that by uh, Wednesday I'll be sacking front benches. Uh, this is a, a bit of a catastrophe for him, isn't it? Well, I think it's certainly... It's very difficult water for him to navigate, but I think he's navigating them very well because he's keeping a very firm eye... Well, not if he has to sack some no, front benches. Well, absolutely, absolutely, Kevin, because, because it, it, he's be it's better for him to stand for what he believes uh, and not have people who don't believe that in his top team. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what he's doing. Look, I think all of the Labour rebels are come from a good place, which is that they want to... Uh, they want to get more aid. Well, the girls. Want, absolutely, as you say. Point. But um, it, 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 I think they're misguided to do this. If they're feeling pressure from their constituency, so, a lot of them are, represent very heavily Muslim constituencies, then they have to decide whether they want to put their role on the front bench first or whether they want to put that. But we've seen lots of honourable people like, remember Claire Shaw, who resigned over the Gulf Wars 30 years ago? She then came back later on in different circumstances, but Keir's been very clear in his leadership, and I think this has become a real test of his leadership, and I'm pleased to say it's one he's meeting. I'll tell you what, if he does have to fire some front benches, uh, so we say tomorrow or later today, and everybody starts going, look at the trouble you're in, never mind me, have you seen Sunak? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I think, the, I think the Tory chaos this week uh, helps him. I mean, how many it times does, today are we going to hear yeah. the Bravo and letter quoted? <laughs> I mean, is this not a situation that we have now of almost the tail wagging the dog? As you were saying, Labour has constituencies in which people are naturally very sympathetic towards uh, Palestine because of perhaps their backgrounds. Um, but Sir Keir Starmer is there trying to make the case very clear that if uh, there was any sort of ceasefire, the terrorists would suddenly get an upper hand again. Why can't he convince his MPs when it's very obvious we're speaking there to Paul Sims in Jerusalem, who uh, is getting intelligence on a regular basis for The Sun, uh, saying that, well, if you do suddenly pause things and get fuel in and get aid in and try and get people out, who is controlling that situation? Because right now, Hamas are the people who essentially control Gaza. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Keir has been absolutely firm that Israel has the right to, to defend itself and that Hamas needs to be removed uh, from Gaza. Uh, and it's absolutely clear uh, that the, uh, just as Joe Biden has been, that the Palestinian Authority ultimately uh, needs to be put in charge. In the short term, uh, uh, international agencies are getting aid into there. The UN, in particular, is feeding most of the people uh, in Gaza. And the idea would be that a pause would allow the UN to be able uh, to, 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 to do that. Uh, uh, but uh, look, I, I think it is. I think it's very unfortunate. I would say to all my comrades, if I may call them that, uh, in the Labour <laughs> if Party. You must. Absolutely. I, you know, I just love saying comrades on this yeah, show. Yeah. Um, um, Never say it again. Oh, uh, that's, I won't. Be let, back. Actually, let me talking Sorry. of comrades. But, let me yeah. just quickly get this question into you, Matthew. Uh, a couple of days ago, Jeremy Corbyn uh, came back uh, from uh, all of our nightmares to appear on uh, uh, Piers Morgan Uncensored and refused twelve times, I think it was to classify Hamas as a terrorist organisation, a terror organisation. I mean, that's not a good look for him and it's not a good look for the Labour Party. Well, it's not a good look for him. He's completely wrong. And never mind a look, he's just morally wrong to say that. I think it's utterly indefensible. And actually, I think it means that the more moderate people who uh, might have supported other things Jeremy said would peer away from any potential support if he runs for London Mayor. So I think he does himself no favours for his own agenda, which is certainly not mine. In terms of the Labour Party, I think it just underlines how right Keir Starmer was to make sure that, 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 that uh, Jeremy Corbyn is not a Labour MP now and will never be a Labour MP again in the future. Uh, yeah. I'm, kind of with him, I'm with you there. <laughs> yeah, Matthew Laza talking about Gaza. Thank you so much for coming into the studio. It's always, always great to get a sensible Labour voice. Uh, well, coming up after the break, the government's Rwanda plan is squashed by the Supreme Court. Does the Prime Minister have a plan B, though? I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching The Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, Uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who that wins? Happens. You. <laughs> Do you know what I love about Talk Today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. 
are you actually speech writing for Rishi Sunak? I'm so rich. <laughs> uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis Sanz? No, I Sanz. am not. Stop pandying to the nimbies, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the preservation of the habitat of the lesser spotted newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Yeah. It's that's almost what like those highly paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. The first thing they teach you in weather school is. Never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah, Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. <gasps> so are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem oh, solved. Yeah. Problem solved. Here you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle class. Three of us here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to boot me off the show after saying <laughs> this now. <laughs> <laughs> right. uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs> got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. They have indeed, <laughs> yeah. Great first show, you having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. <laughs> I think it's only room for one king, man, you know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. Well, I'd rather do it on camera. No. no, 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 no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question, you answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV is not only the home of common sense, it's the only place where you get the truth. On TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Good afternoon and welcome to Crosstalk. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And you are with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. We are live with you from 1 until 3 every weekday afternoon. Coming up this afternoon, Rishi Sunak is warned his entire government is on the line after the Rwanda migrant scheme is torn up by the Supreme Court. Sunak will address the nation this afternoon to insist he has a plan B, but a group of right-wing Tory MPs warn the PM his response to the judgment is now a confidence issue and an existential threat to the entire future of the Conservative Party. Meanwhile, the BBC used the cover of the Rwanda ruling to sneak out an apology after wrongly accusing Israeli defence forces of targeting a hospital in Gaza. All that coming up, but first let's get the news headlines with Zora Suleiman. Thanks, Kevin. Good afternoon. Rishi Sunak says he's prepared to change laws after a massive blow to his immigration policy. The Supreme Court upheld a ruling that it's unlawful to sell asylum, send asylum seekers to Rwanda, saying the country has a poor human rights record. But the Prime Minister says he already has a new treaty with Rwanda in the pipeline, and if it comes to it, he might change the law to make it happen. It becomes clear that our domestic legal frameworks or international conventions are still frustrating plans at that point. I am prepared to change our laws and revisit those international relationships. The British people expect us to do whatever it takes to stop the boats, and that is precisely what this government will deliver. It's reported some Conservative MPs will now want the Prime Minister to pull the UK out of the European Convention on Human Rights. Well, some better news for Rishi Sunak today. He is on track to meet his target of halving inflation. New figures show the rising cost of prices slow to 4.6% in October. That's down from 6.7% in September. It's largely due to an easing off of energy prices. 
The BBC have issued an on-air apology for falsely reporting information about Israeli military action inside Gaza's main Al-Shifa hospital this morning. Israel says it is targeting Hamas, which it believes is running a command centre underneath the building, something it denies, though. Well, however, the broadcaster said the Israeli Defence Force were targeting medics and Arabic speakers. And now uh, an apology from the BBC. A BBC News, uh, as it covered uh, initial reports that Israeli forces has entered Gaza's main hospital. We said that medical teams and Arab speakers were being targeted. This was incorrect and misquoted a Reuters report. We should have said IDF forces included medical teams and Arabic speakers for this operation. So we apologise for this error, which fell below our usual editorial standards. Two 12-year-old boys have been arrested on suspicion of murder after a man was stabbed to death in Wolverhampton. Sean Shisarai died after he was stabbed on Monday night. Detectives say the two schoolboys were arrested at their home addresses and that the investigation is moving at pace. Greta Thunberg has run from members of the media as she left a London court. The Swedish climate activist pleaded not guilty to her public order offence. The 20-year-old was arrested while protesting at an oil and gas industry conference in London last month. She appeared alongside several other activists, including some from Greenpeace. And new figures show the number of cigarette butts dropped in our streets. Keep Britain Tidy found 2.7 million of them are dropped on UK high streets every day. They worked it out by analysing litter collections. Well, that's the latest. Now time for a look at today's weather with Joe Wheeler. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Hello there. Well, today the wet weather is in the north. Tomorrow it'll be in the south. And Friday looks like being a dry day for everybody. But certainly for uh, today, we've seen that rather heavy rain over parts of uh, Scotland, stretching its way down through the northwest into central areas as well. But down towards the south, some lovely sunshine to come, even though it won't be that warm. Temperatures 12 or 13 degrees Celsius, but early blustery winds starting to die away. There'll be some sunshine in the extreme north as well, but not very warm there. Temperatures 4 to 6 degrees Celsius by the middle of the afternoon. Now, it's becoming increasingly mild from the southwest as the cloud works its way into parts of uh, Devon and Cornwall, southern Ireland and south Wales. That's going to bring some heavy rain through this evening, overnight and into tomorrow. That rain pushing its way eastwards. But overnight, clear skies in the far north could allow temperatures to fall as low as minus 6 degrees Celsius. So a widespread frost there and also a bright start to Thursday morning. But elsewhere, a good deal of cloud. Here's the rain. It could actually move a little further north than that. We've got showers through easternmost counties and a further band of cloud and rain working its way into western parts of Ireland. Temperatures on the day, anything between 5 and 9 Celsius. Times Radio sponsors Talk TV Weather. Welcome back to the show. Uh, lots coming up over the next hour. Yeah, is a, and there's always lots going on, isn't there? And today has been a particularly newsy day. The Rwanda uh, plan, yeah. again in ashes. It's never going to actually yeah. happen, is it? Four lights in the Conservative Party. Yeah. Braverman's incendiary letter. E the BBC telling lies about Palestine yet again. BBC. I'll tell you, even by a normal turbulence standards, this is a hectic day. So stick around. Uh, we've got a lot of news to cover. Uh, but, uh, yeah, a hell of a day and... Uh, Rishi Sunak, I don't think he's enjoying it. More of that later. Yeah, and we want to know what you think about the lot of it. Well, now the Rwanda scheme is unlawful, what does Rishi do next? We don't want to know. In fact, I think Rishi wants to know because I don't think he has a clue. So uh, give us uh, your thoughts and perhaps he's listening. Call us on 0344 499 1000 or text us on 8722. Or if you're feeling rather coy, you can instead tweet us on X and use the handle at TalkTV. Well, to that top story now, and the Prime Minister says he's working on a new treaty with Rwanda after the Supreme Court ruled his plan unlawful in a major blow for the government. The President of the Supreme Court, Lord Reid, said there was a risk that genuine refugees would be returned to the country they fled from. 
We accept the Home Secretary's submission that the Rwandan government entered into the agreement in good faith and that the capacity of the Rwandan system to produce accurate and fair decisions can and will be built up. Nevertheless, asking ourselves whether there were substantial grounds for believing that a real risk of reformment existed at the relevant time, we have concluded that there were. The changes needed to eliminate the risk of reformant may be delivered in the future, but they have not been shown to be in place now. The Home Secretary's appeal is therefore dismissed. Thank you, Your Lordship. Rishi Sunak then had a heated exchange with the Labour leader at Prime Minister's Questions, where Sir Keir Starmer accused him of wasting time and money on the plan. He talks about taking small boats crossing seriously. He's opposed every single measure that we have taken, Mr Speaker. Again, let me update him on what we've done this year. The number of illegal Albania arrivals down by 90%. 20,000 people returned this year. The number of crossings down by a third. He mentioned hotels closing 50 of them. Money being saved for taxpayers. All, all, by the way, opposed by the party opposite. What is the honourable gentleman's plan? Ah, yes, there we have it. A cosy deal with the EU, which would see the UK accept a hundred thousand illegal migrants. He doesn't want to stop the boat, he wants to welcome more of them. Mr Speaker, it's very straightforward. He promised, he promised that he would stop the boats this year. Yeah. This year. Today is the 15th of November. He's wasted all of his time on a gimmick. And now he's absolutely nowhere. Will he level with the British public and finally admit he's failed to deliver on his promise? Well, joining us now is Robert Buckland, Conservative MP and former Justice Secretary. Great to have you on the programme. I mean, the last time we had an incursion into politics in a big way from the courts, we all learnt the word prorogue. Uh, and now the word of the day is refoulement. It seems to me that what the government keep doing is putting the cart before the horse. The courts then intervene and say, you can't do that. They should just get rid of this Rwanda plan, shouldn't they? Well, no, no, I think it's important to remember that the principle of sending uh, illegal migrants to a third country is lawful. That was made clear by the courts at all stages of this case, including the Supreme Court. And therefore, what, what I think needs to happen now is, is practical steps to be taken, taking on board all the learning from this case to establish proper uh, arrangements with third countries. It could even include Rwanda, as you implicitly hear, heard from Lord Reid. He said the problem had been the position up to now rather than the future, uh, and, and make sure that you've got a watertight system that uh, you know is fair but is firm. Uh, and I think that that is achievable. Uh, and indeed, the Prime Minister is already planning uh, further work on the, Rwan the Rwanda arrangement, and I very much hope that, that they can get on with that quickly. Don't you think, Robert, he should have had a plan B in place uh, before today? He seems to have segued onto it very swiftly after the Supreme Court decision. Keir Starmer, it's not often I agree with him, but uh, he did point out that uh, the Prime Minister pledged earlier this year that he would stop the boats by the end of the year. He has not a chance in hell of doing that. That's one promise down. Uh, and in reality, negotiating other countries to send our migrants to, there isn't time. He won't get that done before the next election. Uh, what with Suella Braverman shouting from the sidelines uh, with that excoriating letter last night, the Prime Minister's finished, isn't he? Oh, I wouldn't put it at all like that. I mean, the I idea that he would. <laughs> been, well, I think that's wrong. I mean, the, the, the idea he's done nothing in the last year is wrong. I mean, the Albania deal has definitely had an impact on the number of but people. But he's not stopping the boats, Robert. He promised the nation he'd uh, stop the boats. Yeah, yeah, but you're not going to just do that overnight. You've got to start to reduce the numbers. And to be fair to him, the numbers are reducing. Now, I agree the, the pledge is very clear stopping the boats. I'm not trying to resolve from that. Mm. But you've got to start by reducing the numbers. And they are going down. So the next steps, it seems to me, that it does seem he's already been working on, is to uh, reframe that uh, an agreement with Rwanda to, to absolutely make 
make sure that the Rwandan system doesn't allow for this refoulement, uh, you know, the return of people to their country of origin, and also explore, as other European countries are doing as well, deals with other third countries. Now, I accept that the time challenge is big. You know, he's got basically, a, 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 you know, months, if not, you know, weeks to get things moving. But I think we need to get a sense now of momentum in the days ahead. And the pressure's very much on him to do that. Uh, but, I, you know, I think, I think one of the problems here has been the rhetoric has been all about Rwanda as the only solution to the small boats crisis. Of course, it of course is not. You know, there are so many other measures that the government is taking that are having that effect on reducing numbers, which they need to double down on if they are to, uh, you know, meet the aspiration of the British people and deal with this problem. I mean, perhaps some of those other solutions are laid out in Suella Barberman's letter. It seems to me we've waited two years, 140 million in uh, wasted on legal battles due to a back of a fag packet policy that Boris Johnson rushed out to newspapers that's not been able to be delivered. All this time should we not have been leaving the ECHR? No, it wouldn't have made any difference at all to this situation. As the court made very clear, we have domestic laws here in the UK. The international treaty that's relevant is the, is the Refugee Convention. That's where this refoulement term comes from. And, you know, leaving the ECHR is the reddest of red herring. And I think there's far too much politic, playing politics with this issue rather than actually looking at the detail. You know, it's, it's for us to determine our domestic policy. And it's for us to, as we did with that, remember that Abu Qatada case with Jordan? Uh, years ago, where we did get it sorted, that for us to negotiate properly with other countries to make sure their systems are watertight and that we can respect the rule of law and deliver this important policy. Uh, let me ask you about David Cameron, uh, Robert. Uh, so far, uh, in my extensive travels around the country, I haven't seen any bunting up. I haven't seen too many champagne parties going, great, call me Dave is back. Uh, what on earth was the Prime Minister thinking? What, why does he think bringing back a former Prime Minister who was a Remainer is going to be good for this government, which is supposed to be a Brexit government? What is he thinking? Well, I think he's thinking very clearly about the importance of the UK having a presence on the world stage at a time of instability. We've got two wars. We've got a whole host of problems that, uh, you know, have really presented a challenge to not just, you know, us, but the whole way of life that we believe in about liberal democracy and what we stand for. And I think David Cameron has, let's face it, a very, very extensive uh, a list of contacts uh, in his phone. He knows many of the world leaders and many of the big figures in international politics. And I think it's good to get somebody with that institutional experience and memory. Yes, of course, he's got baggage. We've all got baggage in politics. You know, if, you, if you step into the political arena, you're going to get battered around a bit and you're going to get, you know, you're going you're gonna to carry the scars. You know, I, I certainly do. Um, and he, David is no exception. But, you know, I think actually the government is stronger as a result of the decisions that Rishi Sunak made earlier this week. You know, we've got competence there. We've got, I think, a Home Secretary who, again, takes no nonsense and is prepared to work in a team. Uh, and uh, I get a sense that the government is, you know, trying to be grown up and to respond in a sensible way to the issues that, let's face it, you know, are not easy to solve uh, and which we need some straight talking on. I mean, talk about straight talking. He might have a load of baggage. One thing he doesn't have is a constituency. It doesn't seem particularly <laughs> democratic or accountable. No wonder you guys would rather stay in the ECHR and be told what to do by other organisations. I mean, this is That's the problem. That's not how it works. You, That's not you... how it works. We wrote the ECHR. I mean, you know, it's not like the yeah, EU. Like We're not told what to do. These judgments are advisory. The number of times the UK gets found in breach is about once or twice a year on minor stuff that doesn't trouble the newspapers. You know, what what are we, well, why are we having an argument about this? This is, this is just not an issue. And it's being used as a political football to try and gain popularity. But by it, was, it, was a judge, it was a judge in Strasbourg uh, sitting in the European Court of Human Rights who stopped the Rwanda plane taking off. Yeah, well, he issued a, 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 a Rule 39. 39. Why didn't we just, which, uh, uh, why did we just say, oh, sorry, it? mate, it's going to go anyway? Yeah, yeah. Well, why don't we just the, ignore the ECHR if you, you say it doesn't anything, matter? No, you don't ignore... <laughs> international treaties and commitments. That so you they do tell us what to do. They do tell us what to do. So they do tell us what to do. It's not a conservative way to behave. 
you know, we should be absolutely uh, upholding the rule of law and being responsible in government and just pretending that somehow, you know, this country is, okay. you know, we live, we live, we live literally, you know, uh, without any obligations to any other part of the world. It's just nonsense. We need to solve these problems internationally. Well, let... You don't get anywhere by just cocking a snook at the rules and saying, well, they don't apply to us. Well, you uh, could, you but you just said it was just advisory. Yeah, so why don't we not take the advice? However, uh, Suella Bravman said we should leave the ECHR. Dominic Cummings is tweeting today that he told Rishi we've got to leave the ECHR if we ever want to stop the boats, and yet he doesn't. Uh, going forward, well, Robert. Uh, well, right. Going I forward, mean, Robert. That's what that, I'm not saying that's what he's. That's what uh, uh, Suella is. Let me ask you this though, Suella is going to cause merry hell for Mr Sunak going forward. Uh, we know she has quite a few supporters. Uh, the Tory party is now tearing itself apart uh, after the dismissal of the Home Secretary. It's going to be a rocky ride going forward, is it not, for the Prime Minister? Uh, look, I've been around in politics a long time, and I know that divided parties don't win elections. But it's up to all of us to play with the team and to actually come together. Because if we start falling out with each other and arguing with each other in public, why should the public listen to a word we say? And therefore, it's a, it's a responsibility, not just for the Prime Minister, but for every Conservative MP to come together in a way that can help us have a chance of winning this next election. And the behaviour I've seen uh, by some people this week does not respect that historical reality. You know, look back in the history books, learn from the history of how, how the Tory party wins and loses, and, and it's in within our gift to do something about it. So I suggest to everybody, come together. We are still one broad church with many, many principles in common. And let's remember that the real enemy out there is a Labour Party that is the most left-wing since the 70s, and which poses a real threat, I think, to the sound future of this country. They're untried, untested, cobbled together policies that haven't really uh, been uh, scrutinised. And, and we're just allowing Labour to walk in because we, we are having problems. That, that just is not good enough and we've got to do better and fight this Labour Party and take them down. Well, thank you so much for coming on the programme, Robert Buckland. Ben Habib, who's Deputy Chairman of Reform UK, is here in the studio with us. I mean, he's there saying the Conservatives need to learn that when we all come together, we're a broad church, when we all march in the same direction, we do well, and Labour are cobbled together, fighting over everything and can't be trusted. I mean, it's almost like reversing the truth, isn't it? A broad church of shared principles. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? It's a contradiction in terms. A broad church has lots of different principles being applied within it. And that's what we've seen. We've seen a party which can't get its act together, a party which will promise everything in order to get elected and then do precisely nothing. And the idea that um, he should defend the government because it was domestic law that defeated Rwanda, not the ECHR, in my mind, makes it even worse. Domestic law is the remit of Parliament. And last time I looked, these lot have had an, a majority of 80 since 2019 and maybe down to 60 odd now, but they've had a majority. So how can it be domestic law that's brought this policy down and for them to hang their hat on that quite proudly and simultaneously say that we must meet our international obligations, in other words, the abrogation of uh, uh, responsibility in Parliament and therefore m an anti-democratic approach to the way that we govern our country. We, we, we must meet our international obligations under the treaty of the 46 nations or whatever it is that are part of the European Convention of Human Rights. No! What he has to do, what this government has to do, is recognise illegal migration must stop. They have all the authority that they need with their majority in order to pass whatever law they need to pass to make that happen, and then they need to make it happen. And as you rightly said, Alex, it's been three years, and we've just watched this problem continue. It's been 15, continue. Ben. It's been 15. <laughs> but since this government came to office, it's a complete joke. And also, there was something... In, there was an inherent contradiction in what he said. Mm. The ECHR doesn't matter. It's merely advisory. It was good of Robert to come it's on, It's not by advisory. The way. Well, well, well he, yeah. it, it, he says it's just advisory. He's wrong. So if we wanted to, we could overrule the plans. Well, if you don't overrule them, then you, have to, you are obeying their laws. They're the ones who stopped that plane taking off. Uh, so uh, when Suella Bravman and Dominic Cummings advised successive prime ministers, we have to leave the 
ECHR. If you want any chance of stopping the boats, they all ignored, uh, ignored her. And basically, and they ignored Dominic Cummings. And uh, now they are at this situation. They yeah. are screwed. I mean, I, I actually, I mean, one point of principle is that to stop the boats, actually, all you need to do is to stop the boats. Right. Turn them around. <laughs> You've got to turn them around. And what this government and every other government in Western liberal democracy seems to have been hijacked by is the notion that you can't actually physically try to en enforce your borders. Mm -hmm. You have an international right, and in my mind, the government has, an in uh, has a domestic legal obligation to the people of this country to stop the country being assaulted by illegal migrants seeking to enter it. What are we? We can't be a country if we don't have borders. Mm. It's a statement of the obvious. This government needs to grow a back... Well, it's not going to grow a backbone. <laughs> this, government, this government needs to get out. And the biggest threat to the Tory party, by the way, is not the Labour Party. The biggest threat to the par Tory party is Reform UK. He's mentioned the Labour Party. We are going to take the Tories apart. They've done a splendid job taking themselves apart, but we are going to take the Tory party apart because they are not worthy of government. The last sensible minister that they had in cabinet was Suella. She stood for Brexit. Three out of the four reasons that she resigned were effectively Brexit pledges that this government's broken. They've moved, they've tacked completely away from that. They've put an arch remainer in as foreign policy. Outrageous. One of his jobs is going to be to deal with the EU. So we know we're going to go back even closer to the EU. We never really got out. He's going to take us back even closer. And the notion that David Cameron, a man who set North Africa ablaze and the Middle East ablaze with his support of the Arab Spring in 2011, nearly brought Egypt to its knees, nearly brought Saudi to its knees, that this man, who was absolutely fast and loose with British military might in that region, destabilising all of it, can bring peace to Gaza. It's completely ridiculous. David Cameron shouldn't be anywhere near office. He resigned in ignominy because he lost the biggest... A democratic... Talking of his mistakes, that was his biggest that mistake. That was his biggest mistake. Totally misjudged the British people. Yeah, I think I th we had Richard Dearlove, uh, the former head of MI6, on a couple of days ago, and he worked with Cameron when he was Prime Minister, and uh, in essence, what Mr Dearlove told us was, I don't trust this guy's judgment, and I think a lot of us feel uh, the same about David Cameron. He's just made mistake after mistake Absolutely. after mistake. And let's not forget And he's Greenfield. back in power. But let me ask you this, Ben. In, in, in reality, uh, th this Tory party, you know, the, go the party of government, is absolutely split right down the middle at the moment with the Suella fans and the Rishi fans. Uh, it is dysfunctionally unravelling. This is a problem going forward. Yeah. Sunak is barely going to be able to uh, he's, do his he, job. He's a, he, he, he was virtually a busted flush last week. He is now a completely busted flush. There's no coming back from this for, 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 for Sunak. Mm. He will be toasted at the next election. And let me tell you, I can't wait. I'm apoplectic. It may come across in my voice. Yeah. You know, you watch... You watch yeah, these calm people. Down, calm yeah, down. I know, but you watch <laughs> these people. Solemnly, people vote for their government based on promises they make. People put their trust in government. They hope that their interests will be mm. protected and promoted, and they get trounced left, right and centre. Then you have someone like Suella Braverman, whether you like her rhetoric or not, who's actually trying to deliver the manifesto pledges, and they sack her. I, I, you know, I just... But you know why I think her letter last night resonated so much? It, you know, we can't definitively say that, but everything you read that she said about him, you know, you're weak, you're not a leader, you break your promises, uh, you don't seem to have any convictions, uh, you, you're standoffish, you're a technocrat, you're a manager, everything in that letter, we all read it and went, yeah, that sounds about right. I think he's been <laughs> nailed, he's been rumbled. Oh, he really has. I mean, she... she... The great shame with Suella is that she didn't resign, because... Yes, yeah, you could have called it resignation letter. It technically wasn't. Yeah, I mean, you know... Fired. And if, if, he, if he turned his back, as he did, on all those major pledges that she says she had from him, including the Northern Ireland Protocol Bill, which is very dear to my heart, um, the, the retained EU law bill, we've still got all the basic EU laws on our statute books. If he turned his back on that, as he did, um, she should have resigned. The Windsor framework is the cementing in of the Irish Sea border and the giving away of Northern Ireland to a foreign power. Mm. And that, for me, 
it doesn't seem to exercise many people's minds in, in Great Britain. But that, for me, is the single most damaging thing that Boris Johnson and now Sunak have done. I, I can't... And, uh, you know, if you're prepared to partition your own country, you're surely going to let the country down in every other respect. <laughs> because you're not a man of principle. You're not a person who's going to deliver in the national interest. So when that IRC border went in, we all knew, you knew, Alex, because you were part of the Brexit party in those days, we knew that this government is not going to deliver the Brexit that they promised. You've been a part of a lot for a lot of days, mate. <laughs> Do you know what I should be a part of? I should just, like, pull a couple of pints, put some peanuts in a yeah. bowl, let you two get on with oh, it. Oh, sorry, sorry, no, sorry. Anyway, Ben, thank you ever so much for coming into the studio. Yeah. Uh, always great to hear your thoughts on uh, everything, quite frankly. Now, uh, I mean, there's a lot going on today, isn't there? Yeah. It's uh, a lot to You didn't talk ask about. me if I'm allergic to nuts. You, you <laughs> have to do that head. everywhere you go. The waiters go, wait, it was, are there any allergies? Oh, yeah, sorry, I didn't share that with you. What's going on in restaurants? But I digress. <laughs> I'd like a pint next yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah let's have some pint. <laughs> do you know, I think I'm going to... I just think I'm going to delegate myself to a new role of bar wench. <laughs> now, your texts and tweets have been coming in thick and fast this lunchtime. We've been asking, now that the Rwanda scheme is unlawful, what does Rishi Sunak do next? Pete says the only chance the country has of not having a huge Labour majority government for the next five years is for the Tories to vote out Rishi Sunak and put Suella Braverman in as PM. Another leader. They will still lose, but force Starmer to have to haggle for every policy he tries to put through. And Thomas has this solution, pay the boat smuggler gangs to stop. It works in Northern Ireland, paying terrorists in government, <laughs> i.e. Jerry Kelly on the policing board. That's a rather left-field policy. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Meanwhile, Vic asks, uh, why can't we claim political asylum in Rwanda and use that plane on the runway? After all, I have paid into the system over here, so I should be kept in a hotel in the sunshine in Rwanda. P.S. A safari tour would also be nice. You can't beat them, can you? Uh, Thomas, meanwhile, is exasperated. He says, for heaven's sake, do the Brits really believe France is going to halt the migrants? Rishi surely is not that naive. If all the figures cleverly spouted are true, then we have a grip on it. Not. And uh, Leslie asks, why is Labour so delighted by the judges ruling against Rwanda? Their glee speaks volumes. Well, coming up after the break, the BBC has apologised for their false reporting on the Israeli Defence Force's actions inside Gaza's Al Shifa Hospital. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart screen.
Welcome back to the show. I'm Kevin O'Sullivan. And I'm Alex Phillips. And this is Cross Talk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online and on your smart speaker. Now, the BBC has issued an on-air apology this morning for their false reporting on the Israel Defence Force's actions inside Gaza's Al-Shifa hospital. The organisation incorrectly stated that Reuters, the news agency, were reporting that the IDF were targeting Arab speakers and medical staff after Israeli troops attacked the medical facility on Tuesday. BBC News responded with this statement today. And now uh, an apology from the BBC. A BBC News, uh, as it covered uh, initial reports that Israeli forces has entered Gaza's main hospital. We said that medical teams and Arab speakers were being targeted. This was incorrect and misquoted a Reuters report. We should have said IDF forces included medical teams and Arabic speakers for this operation. So we apologise for this error, which fell below our usual editorial standards. The correct version of events was broadcast minutes later. Well, the Jewish Board of Deputies has responded to the BBC report saying, at best, this shows a staggering lack of care when reporting on a highly volatile situation, which can have a knock-on effect all over the world, including in Britain, where anti-Semitic attacks have risen by more than 500% since October the 7th. Incidents like this make a mockery of the BBC's oft-stated dedication to professionalism and impartiality. The corporation must issue a public apology without delay for this egregious reporting. Well, joining us now is editor of the Jewish Chronicle, Jake Wallace-Simons. Jake, when I read this story, I was absolutely astonished because when you compare the two things that were said, Reuters saying that, uh, and quoting the IDF, we can confirm incubators, baby food and medical supplies brought by IDF tanks from Israel have successfully reached the Shiva hospital. Our medical teams and Arabic speaking soldiers are on the ground to ensure that these supplies reach those in need, i.e. Arabic speakers within the IDF are making sure medicine gets to people who need it in hospital. And somehow the BBC turned that into the IDF are targeting Arab speakers in the hospital. This isn't an editorial mistake. This isn't just an accidental tripping over of words, surely. Well, I mean, from one point of view, it's a bit like those uh, football bloopers when you see a goalkeeper trying to throw the ball out to a defender and mistakenly throwing it into his own net. But at the same time, you must ask the question, if the same goalkeeper keeps making the same mistake and keeps scoring own goals in that way, what's wrong with the goalkeeper? And a lot of viewers, I think, are asking the same question about the BBC because even though I'm sure, having I've worked at the BBC a lot, I'm a big fan of the BBC in general, but even though I don't think that any BBC journalist goes to work in the morning saying, you know what, I'm going to be biased today, let's forget impartiality, throw it out of the window, I'm just going to stick it to the Jews. No one goes to work and says that. But, the, but whenever a mistake is made, it tends to be a mistake in the same direction. Uh, we haven't seen any mistakes, as far as I'm aware, in the opposite direction, mistakenly reporting too kindly on the Israelis or mistakenly criticising Hamas too much or anything like that. Um, it always seems to be uh, in this same direction. I think that's a, a problem that the BBC uh, is going to struggle to tackle and, and doesn't really have any ideas about how to deal with it. Yeah, because, Jake, this follows, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, wasn't it, when that missile uh, landed actually in a hospital car park and uh, it turned out to have been a terrorist missile, nothing to do uh, with the Israelis, and yet the BBC, a guy called John Donison, on the scene said it's something along the lines of it's difficult to see who could be responsible for this attack other than the IDF, than the Israelis. Turned out to be absolutely not the IDF or the Israelis, who are both the same things, of course. Uh, and now we have uh, this situation. Now, what I think, uh, you know, if we were being extremely generous, generous uh, I'll take your point that uh, all their mistakes seem to be in the same direction. But if we're being extremely generous, say that, you know, journalists do sometimes make honest mistakes, uh, I suspect this isn't all that honest, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Here's another scandal, though, uh, to this apology that they were forced to make. What did they do? They did it very, very quietly while the Rwanda verdict was being announced by the Supreme Court. In other words, they tried to slip it under the wire. They tried to make this a good day to bury bad news for the BBC. Not really being transparent with licence fee payers, wouldn't you say? You, you could see it like that, I suppose. But I think from the BBC's point of view, if they had delayed it further, then they'd be under more criticism for delaying it. I mean, there was a, 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 a big 
level of outrage towards this egregious misreporting with good reason. And I think the BBC was under a lot of pressure to respond quickly and not to string this out. Uh, and so I think in a way they're in a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of position. Um, but let's look at the other uh, example you mentioned of the hospital. I think we must recognise that pretty much all media outlets around the world made the same mistake as the BBC, or many of them did. The New York Times had to apologise as well, and other papers and, and outlets also apologised. But the BBC, for a start, has a greater burden of responsibility because it is charged explicitly with impartiality and it's funded by the licence fee player, uh, payer. But also I would point out that, as the Jewish Chronicle has revealed, John Donison, that reporter that you mentioned who went freelance and speculated that it must be the Israelis in this case, he has form. He had previously uh, been criticised and actually penalised by the BBC for um, tweeting a picture of an atrocity in Syria and saying that it was uh, an example of Israeli brutality in Gaza. So this guy had form. So all I'm saying is that the BBC has a history of many mistakes of this sort, um, and it, it does seem to form a bit of a pattern that does need to be addressed, but how they can address it under the surface, it's a cultural thing, I think is very, very difficult for them. I think you're being rather generous towards the BBC, if I may say so myself, and certainly I'd like to assume that UK journalists might make mistakes but do work for the BBC wanting to uphold impartiality, even if sometimes culturally they struggle with it. But let's not forget, the BBC is an internationally extremely influential organisation via the World Service, has lots of different outputs in different languages all around the world, uses various stringers and has employees in BBC offices in, in, in almost every country on the planet. Do you not think actually when things have quietened down a bit, there needs to be some sort of audit as, as to quite who they might have employed, particularly when there is such a burden of international responsibility? Yes, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, I think that in particular, BBC Arabic is a real problem. Uh, at the Jewish Chronicle, we've we've uh, reported a lot on the uh, on the repeated uh, departures from impartiality at BBC Arabic in the Arabic language, which is broadcast to millions and millions of viewers uh, across the Middle East and has a very very powerful influence. Um, repeatedly calling all Israeli settlers and all Israeli town settlements, repeating Hamas talking points. We had an example of. Um, a terrorist folk song being celebrated and sung uh, in the studio uh, and the allegation that Israel had no culture of its own, only what it had stolen from other other cultures, things like that. Uh, and indeed, there were there's been about more, I think, 100 or 200 upheld complaints over the past couple of years about BBC Arabic. So that's complaints that have been found by the BBC to be valid and upheld and worthy of correction. Uh, and yet they keep on happening. So BBC Arabic is a particular pocket of Israelophobia, if you like. It's particularly problematic. Um, and that does really need to be addressed. But as for the English English language output, again, the same mistakes happen again and again. There is a cultural problem, I believe, at the BBC, where it's, it, they, they focus very much on diversity of race, diversity perhaps of class and disabilities and so on, but very little on diversity of political view. And I think that that leads to a kind of groupthink, which overall can tend to bleed out in its coverage, even though it's trying to be impartial. Uh, some years ago, uh, Jake, the BBC commissioned an investigation into the possibility that it was inherently anti-Semitic, that there was groupthink against Jews there. Uh, they carried out this investigation and uh, guess what? Uh, they never published it. What do we deduce from that? Well, there has been, there has been some uh, outrage about that consistently coming and going over the past few years. Um, I don't know what, what that contains. Um, uh, and there are mixed views from, from inside the corporation as to whether it does, uh, it, it is damning or not. Uh, but the Jewish Chronicle last year ran a campaign calling for an inquiry into BBC reporting on Jews in Israel. That was in the wake of, if you recall, the incident over Hanukkah, where some Jewish kids were taunted and abused in the street and the BBC mistakenly reported that the, Jew, that the Jewish kids had provoked them by uttering some racial slur, which they had not. Um, and so in the wake of that and the other reporting we've been doing into BBC Arabic and other things, we called for an inquiry. We had a petition that attracted 
10,000 signatures. And in the end, um, some peers in the House of Lords and others accepted that and said they were going to take it on. I'm not sure what's happened uh, with that, but we hope that that will happen sometime over the next year or so. Uh, but something does need to happen because the BBC does need, I think, to have a long, hard look at what's going on and what can be done to correct it. BBC Arabic needs some serious attention, but then more broadly across the corporation, we need to find a way to widen the uh, the the the, uh, the perspective of BBC journalists so that that blind spot towards Jews in Israel no longer exists and that impartiality is upheld. Thank you so much, Jake Wallace-Simons. Always a pleasure. We have more of your texts and tweets coming in this lunchtime, all focusing on today's ruling on the government's proposed Rwanda scheme. Terry says, when Cameron and co take us back into the EU, we will have to have the single currency. Giving the EU control of our interest rates will also have to be in the single market and customs union, meaning we have to rip up those trade deals and become part of the Schengen thereby removing what remains of our borders. Yeah, at least it's some comfort to me that it means it probably won't happen. But, you know, <laughs> I still live in fear. Craig says, how do you know if an asylum case is true and legitimate without any papers? I'm baffled by all of this. It makes no sense. To go on holiday abroad, we have to jump through so many hoops, but someone who comes here on an inflatable boat has no problems and free accommodation, food and medical care. Tony says, stand by for a mass amnesty to bring the waiting list down. My guess is 100,000 illegals would just be waved through by the Tories. And Wayne says, Rishi can't even run a bath, let alone this country. <laughs> I, I, I think I probably agree with that. <laughs> I don't want to see him running a bath, to be honest. That's the stuff of nightmares. Well, at least he might be able to do that quite efficiently. Uh, as for running the country, I don't know. <laughs> Can't run his own party, that's for sure. <laughs> Coming up after the break, a killer of Olivia pratt Corbell causes outrage as his taxpayer-funded legal aid bill grows. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and you're with Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Everybody. Hope you're well. Thanks for joining us. You're watching the Independent Republic of Mike Graham right here on Talk TV. Welcome to Friday Night with Nadine. Here on Primetime, we like to speak to the business people behind big moments. Good evening, I'm Piers Morgan, uncensored in New York City. Very impressive, well played. I'm three days into the job. What have I done wrong? Yeah. And your face just stared <laughs> out at me. Ah. <laughs> me and you, conquer time. Who Bye. wins? You. <laughs> do you know what I love about tour today? We do it all. Sunak, Suella, scones. Are you actually speech rating for this? You see, like, I'm so rich. <laughs> but, uh, frankly, uh, I'm going to take the side of boozed up Brits against these pompous. What, do you mean you're not going to support Mayor Jose no, Luis I am not. Stop pandying to the NIMBYs, to the naysayers, and the National Society for the Preservation of the Habitat of the Lesser Spotted Newt. The problem lies in the bureaucracy. Well, it's almost like those highly done. paid consultants don't really know what they're doing. First thing they teach you in weather school is never confuse dog walkers with doggers. Twitter, you sons of <laughs> <laughs> Can you please reinstate my account? Yeah. Thank you. There's a threat that you'd be worried about. So are you saying that you're being overwhelmed, that you're inundated? We are really working hard for you. and We're just asking patients to be patient with us. Are we only going to be trusting sources like Meta and Google and Facebook and X, uh, formerly known as Twitter? Where is, our, where is our unbiased news going to come from? Welcome to the talk. It's really great to be back. My little darlings. Mm -hmm. Kids think all they have to do is stay at home, be silly, mm -hmm. take pictures of everything. Just shut down TikTok then, yeah? Problem solved. solved. Yeah. Problem solved. There you go. He's fit as a butcher's dog. Him. Oh, right. <laughs> but, but he's now middle <laughs> class. Three here, Tess. <laughs> I nearly have empathy when I'm speaking to them. I know now you're probably going to whoop me off the show after <laughs> this now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kevin O'Sullivan is the worst presenter on Talk TV. <laughs> Sitting on his fat ass <laughs> talking for a living. <laughs>
We've got former PMs all over the joint saying things the last few days. We have indeed, yeah. Great first show. You having fun? Oh, a ton of fun. Yeah. King Piers and King Cube. I think it's only room for one king, man. You know what I'm saying? Just because they're skin folk don't mean they're kin folk. When I say I am God, you think I'm joking or not? You tell me. I'm not joking. I'd rather do it on camera. No, no, no. no. If it's on camera, we're not doing the interview. Why? We'll explain why. How do you feel about that influence that you have? You better be careful. We're coming for your children there, buddy. About my resignation, yes, I'm going to go. I'm you're, going going to, you're going to resign? Yeah, I'm going. I've been answering your question. You answer mine. It's actually not my job to answer your questions. Thank God for Talk TV. It's not only the home of common sense. It's the only place where you get the truth. Welcome back to the show. I'm Alex Phillips. And I'm Kevin O'Sullivan, and this is Crosstalk on Talk TV, on TV, on radio, online, and on your smart speaker. Now, the taxpayer-funded legal aid costs of Olivia Pratt Corbell's killer have reached more than £220,000 after he made a failed second appeal to get his jail term cut. Thomas Cashman was jailed for a minimum of 42 years after shooting the nine-year-old through the front door of her Liverpool home. But he lost his bid to reduce his sentence at a court of appeal hearing today set to add tens of thousands of pounds to his legal aid bill. This coincides with the parole hearing for Jamie Borger killer John Venables, which began yesterday. Uh, joining us now is retired Scotland Yard Detective Chief Inspector Mike Neville. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mike. Where are you today? Uh, Sutton, the London Borough of Sutton today. Uh, there you so go, good, always somewhere good, good different, afternoon. always somewhere different. Uh, I used to work in Sutton, but we digress. I was the chief reporter of the Sutton Herald. If you, anyone is interested, uh, <laughs> nobody, I would imagine, except for me. Uh, seriously, uh, so we have these two cases going on. Uh, essentially, this is state-funded leniency for monsters uh, that we, the taxpayer, have to pay these people's vast legal bills uh, while they challenge their sentences, while they try to get re released from prison. Uh, you know, Thomas Cashman obviously should not have his sentence re uh, reduced and indeed didn't, but it cost us a quarter of a million quid. Meanwhile, John Venables is taking our money to mount his bid to be released from prison, despite the fact he killed Jamie Bulger and is inside for serious paedophile offences. You know, why do we put up with this, Mike? Why do we allow the authorities to take our money to fund these monsters, uh, basically just to play around with our legal system to see if they can get anything out of it? We need to do something about this, don't we? Well, we absolutely need to do something about it. But, of course, the whole thing is controlled by the liberal left-wing blob. Uh, how many... What percentage of uh, of MPs are lawyers? You see, there's al there's always a winner in these cases, and it's uh, lawyers. That's where the 200,000 or 220,000 pounds has gone. And, of course, what people will see as well, what's even more outrageous, is that Cashman wouldn't even come up to hear his sentence. So he wouldn't come up to hear his sentence, and then he wanted it to be reduced. I would suggest that if you've got 10 more years for not coming up those stairs, then he might think uh, twice about it. Uh, but what we see all the time is that the justice system lives in a different bubble from what uh, I would suggest most members of the public uh, would like it to. Of course, we want to see people, if any of us were charged with a crime or in prison or whatever, we should be entitled to some form of uh, legal help to, to, to if we were if we were guilty if we were uh, subject to an injustice but it comes to a point where what is the limit because it's gone too far it's ridiculous the man killed a 40 he got 42 years for killing a nine-year-old girl he should be hanged that's what should happen to him so he should be quite happy that he's still alive uh, but the public i think just as you say they're appalled but if people keep voting for the same same old, same old. I'm afraid we will get the same old, same old because it's the uh, parliament is full of lawyers. I mean, Mike, in your experience, does this add extra weight and put extra pressure on serving police officers, particularly detectives, because they have to meet thresholds, according to the Crown Prosecution Service, and know that they've got a body of evidence to make sure someone who's done something pretty horrific does get locked up. If criminals who are then serving big sentences can go back and say, well, actually, I want a few years cut off that, please, and it requires trawling back through all of that police evidence, does that not, therefore, add extra weight and extra of pressure onto the forces. 
it, it sometimes will if there's an if there's an appeal against the actual conviction when it's appeal against the the sentence that that's a matter for the uh, and that's what we're seeing here uh, that's a matter for the lawyers and judges because the the actual evidence is not disputed if there is an appeal and he said look it simply wasn't me or it, it was an accident uh, and there was a, they allowed an appeal then that would of course uh, create a lot of extra work for for the detectives on the case I was going to say, it must be very disenchanting and demoralising for police officers, though, who in many cases work for a very long time to make sure bad people get banged up and then end up seeing these monsters essentially uh, legal aid funded to try and wriggle out of it. Of course. And well, the, 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 when you're an experienced detective, you expect this, you expect to meet uh, slippery lawyers and the like. Uh, and of course, I, I've no doubt what a great piece of work by the Merseyside police to put this uh, evil man away for 42 years. And I'm sure that the, the senior detective in charge of the case and the, and the rest of the uh, officers are, still, are very pleased uh, that he's still there for that amount of time. If we go back to John Venables, uh, the killer of uh, poor little Jamie Bulger, uh, who's been in and out of jail uh, throughout his adult life. He was only 10 when he killed uh, Jamie Bulger. Uh, he's in jail now for serious paedophile uh, offences all through his life. This man has been a serious threat to children. As you and I have discussed many times, you can't uh, reform paedophiles, that you cannot uh, cure them of their condition. And therefore, uh, I, I do not understand why John Venables uh, is being considered for parole. They shouldn't let him out, should they? I'm absolutely with you. So when we when you release a you know a burglar or a robber, you sort of you take a chance that uh, ho hopefully this person won't do it again. Because but if they do it again, it's a bad thing. But if they're attacking adults, it's not nice. It's unpleasant. But when you've got somebody who's a risk to children, uh, like Venables, he's been convicted of murdering one little boy twice. He's been convicted of having uh, hideous paedophile pornography. He should never ever be released because. By releasing him, you're you're saying, oh, we take a chance. But what I would always the trouble with these things is the people who make these decisions, whether they're parole board or magistrates or judges giving bail or soft sentences, they never have to live with the consequences. Because these people are then binned off on some council estate in Liverpool, Bolton, Stoke, and Middlesbrough, somewhere on you know, unfashionable. And the people who've made the decision still live in their nice house. I, I would say if you want to release him, then you must ex uh, ex accept the fact he's going to live next to your grandchildren or something. And that might focus the people's minds when they're releasing these creatures. I'll tell you something, Mike. I'd also like to know why John Venables is still uh, granted anonymity. I don't really get it. Uh, why can't we say who this guy is? Mm. Why can't Absolutely. We... I mean, he's not, a ch he's not a child anymore. He's, he's a grown man. He's in his 40s and he's committing these wicked offences. So we need to know who he is. So if he tries to, uh, you know, yeah. get in with we some need to a be woman able to and a family that he's identified. Yes, absolutely. We Mike, do. thank you ever so much for joining us there. Uh, Mike thank Neville. You. Thank you so much. Sadly, uh, we've come to the end of the show, Alex. Yeah, we have. And do you know what? It, it makes me think. We heard in the King's speech, didn't we? The government promising tougher sentences. Yet another promise, no doubt. Yeah. Rishi Sunak can add to the, his list that will, well, clearly never be delivered. The state That's of the nation we state have. State of the today. nation. What state a state. Nation. What a terrible state. Well, yeah. that is the end of the show today. Thank you for tuning in. Please do join me and Alex same time tomorrow. Up next is Ian Collins. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>